Good morning. Thank you for joining us for worship with the First Congregational Church of Westbrook. I am the Reverend Dr. Jan Gregory Sharpentier, and I am glad to be leading us in worship today. Whether we are joining in real time on Sunday morning, July 19th, or whether you are catching this online or broadcast on cable, later in the day or week. We are together in the spirit of God. So let us worship with joy and with wonder and lean into the stories of our faith that we might be strengthened as the people of God. We begin our worship with the gift of song brought to us by our church musician, Elena Zamolochikova. ever notice how in the story of God's people from the very beginning all the way through the final pages of the Bible, God's people are almost always on the move. Jesus, our teacher, our guide, was never in one place for very long. He claimed no home turf, no sovereign state, nor bordered homeland, but rather he invited us to join him in that property-less place, that realm of God that he said is near, is among us, is within us. So my fellow pilgrims, grab your walking sticks, Grab your sandals, reach out your hand to your companion, and let us hit the road together on this journey of risk and redemption as we worship the God who calls us into the future, a people on the move, inspired and led by love. Our opening hymn today, led by Jim Dahl, is... Guide me, O oh thy great Jehovah. Guide me, O oh thou great Jehovah, pilgrim through this barren land. I am weak, but 
that thou art mighty, hold me with thy powerful hand. Bread of heaven, bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more. Feed me till I want no more. Open now the crystal fountain whence the healing stream doth flow. Let the fire and cloudy pillar lead me all the journey through. Strong deliverer, strong deliverer, be thou still my strength and shield. Be thou still my strength and shield. When I tread the verge of Jordan, bid my anxious fear subside. Lead me on through death's destruction, land me safe on Canaan's side. Songs of praises, songs of praises, I will ever give to thee. Please join me in our opening prayer. On this journey of faith and healing, of redemption and renewal, may we open our minds and hearts to see you, O God, in the stranger and the friend. We are all wanderers and seekers. Some of us think we're found. Some of us know we're lost. But your leading hand and your saving grace guide us like a beacon toward the home you have always intended. As you have received our refugee souls, help us make room for all those joining our company of grace. As you, the prodigal God of love, throw open your arms to welcome us all. Amen. And singing together words of praise. friends gathered here on Sunday or later in the week. We are still joined in love and spirit, and so we are the company of Christ friends gathered for worship together. Our church still has activities going on all around us, even though our building is mostly standing empty but still we are active in ministry. And here are some ways that you can be involved. We have summer book groups ongoing. The next one will be starting up in August and we will be reading Sue Monk Kidd's new novel, The Book of Longings, a creative and slightly radical retelling of the story of Jesus and If you pre-register for that by going to our website and signing up, we will cover $10 towards the purchase of your book and hope that you will join us. We are having a wonderful time so far in June and July reading the novels that were selected. And we had a wonderful opportunity this last week on Thursday night to gather in person praise God, and see one another's faces, even though behind masks and socially distanced. But we met at the outdoor chapel 
at the Incarnation Center in Deep River and celebrated the beauty and the peace and the fellowship that we shared together. And we will be doing so three more times this summer and you are heartily invited to join us. Our me next meeting will be July 30th and you need to pre-register for that as well by calling the church office so that we can have an accurate list and we can make sure that our risk reduction protocols are being observed. So hope that you will join us. And finally, next Sunday, you are invited to worship with the good people of the United Church of Chester, our sister United Church of Christ congregation, a town or two away. I will be away taking some time off among other things, celebrating the wedding of my brother who lost his wife to cancer in 2018 and is getting married again next weekend. So I will be away and our online worship service will be with the Chester congregation. I have sent out a link to their service and I will send it out to our members again. And that service begins at 10 a.m. So you get the 15 more minutes of relaxation next Sunday morning. Let us continue in worship as we join our hearts and our spirits in prayer. Please pray with me as you would at home. I pray here out loud. Holy One, whose love knows no limits, no borders, no fences, no walls. You open your arms with redeeming love and welcome us into your family of faith. Like tired travelers, we lean upon your strength. So glad to be known and loved, so weary of all that wears us down, so hopeful that you will lift us up. Kicking the stones along our dusty roads, we can forget the beauty of this journey. Over the miles from what was to what is and will be, we have passed countless miracles, some random and wild, some faithfully ordinary, but all an expression of your love. So Pilgrim Lord, lead us further on and deeper in. Take us with you, we pray, on your sojourn of love and justice to bring healing and hope to a famished world. Whither you go, we long to go. Whither you stay, we wish to stay. May not even death part us one from another. In your company, you make us friends across the borderlands of difference and division. We hail the champions of your inclusive love, like John Lewis, whose final freedom ride is safely completed. We extend our prayers to family, friends, neighbors, and even foes that following your peripatetic heart, we might make camp and break bread with sisters and brothers we've yet to meet and know. Hold our fallen ones, care for our wounded ones, heal our sick ones, restore our broken ones. In silence, we name those for whom we personally pray. And we pray for our world. We are still reeling with pandemic and public outcry. We have failed to be the beloved community you have called us to be. May your mercy and forgiveness cover even these latest catastrophes till we are bathed and renewed and redeemed once more. Fill our hearts with courage to love better than we think we're able. By your spirit and your grace, carry us with you. Under your wings of refuge, we find peace and purpose and will once more step out to serve the world in Jesus' name. We pray now with the words he taught us, saying, Our Father, Mother, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now praying in song, we hear the gift of our choir. through this series titled The Forgotten Books of the Bible, dipping into five Hebrew scripture texts that are read at the Jewish festivals that perhaps don't get read by us very often. And we are going to be journeying with Ruth the Moabite today. The book of Ruth is short and sweet. We perhaps know this well-known daughter-in-law who accompanies her mother-in-law back home. And we maybe know that Ruth gets woven into the story of God's people as she becomes King David's grandmother. But the part of the scripture we are going to be digging into today is the middle section where she has returned to Bethlehem with Naomi and she is trying to supply the food necessary for their small family through the tradition of gleaning. Gleaning was really Israel's 
social welfare system where it was required that those who were harvesting the grain and the fruits of the field would leave some around the margins for the poor and the unprovided for to pick from what is left. And you'll hear references to gleaning in this story. And you're gonna hear about Boaz, who will become Ruth's husband. And you will hear about his generosity and her surprise at being so warmly welcomed as a foreigner, as an immigrant from Moab to Judah. So let us turn to the story of Ruth and Boaz and the continuation of God's family tree. Now, Naomi had a kinsman on her husband's side, a prominent rich man of the family of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. And Ruth, the Moabite, said to Naomi, let me go to the field and glean among the ears of grain behind someone in whose sight I may find favor. She said to her, go, my daughter. So she went. She came and gleaned in the field behind the reapers. As it happened, she came to the part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the family of Elimelech. Just then, Boaz came from Bethlehem. He said to the reapers, the Lord be with you. And they answered, the Lord bless you. Then Boaz said to his servant who was in charge of the reapers, to whom does this young woman belong? The servant who was in charge of the reapers answered, she is the Moabite who came back with Naomi from the country of Moab. She said, please let me glean and gather among the sheaves behind the reapers. So she came behind the reapers and she has been on her feet from early morning until now without resting for even a moment. Then Boaz said to Ruth, now listen, my daughter, do not go to glean in another field or leave this one, but keep close to my young women. Keep your eyes on the field that is being reaped and follow behind them. I have ordered the young men not to bother you. If you get thirsty, go to the vessels and drink from what the young men have drawn. Then she fell prostrate with her face to the ground and said to him, why have I found favor in your sight that you should take notice of me when I am a foreigner? But Boaz answered her, all that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband has been fully told me, and how you left your father and mother and your native land and came to a people that you did not know before. May the Lord reward you for your deeds, and may you have a full reward from the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come for refuge. Then she said, may I continue to find favor in your sight, my Lord, for you have comforted me and spoken kindly to your servant, even though I am not one of your servants. At mealtime, Boaz said to her, come here and eat some of this bread and dip your morsel into the sour wine. So she sat beside the reapers and he heaped up for her some parched grain. She ate again until she was satisfied and she had some left over. When she got up to glean, Boaz instructed his young men, let her glean even among the standing sheaves and do not reproach her. You must also pull out some handfuls for her from the bundles and leave them for her to glean and do not rebuke her. So she gleaned in the field until evening. Then she beat out what she had gleaned and it was about an ephah of barley. She picked it up and came into the town, and her mother-in-law saw how much she had gleaned. Then she took out and gave her what was left over after she herself had been satisfied. Her mother-in-law said to her, where did you glean today? And where have you worked? Blessed be the man who took notice of you. So she told her mother-in-law with whom she had worked and said, the name of the man with whom I work today is Boaz. Then Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, blessed be he by the Lord, whose kindness has not forsaken the living or the dead. Naomi also said to her, the man is a relative of ours, one of our nearest kin. Would you please pray with me? 
Holy One, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Welcome, my friends. As I prepare here to share with you on this story that we have just heard. In so many ways, the story of Ruth is a simple story, only four chapters long. It tells the story of a family twice imperiled, twice displaced, finally finding shelter and security through the agency and ingenuity of two women whose lives become intertwined through grief and grace. You may recall the basic outline of the story and some of its best known verses. The Hebrew family of Elimelech leaves their home in Judah in the midst of a great famine. He and his wife, Naomi, and their two sons find food and a new home in Moab, ironically an ancient adversary of Israel. The boys grow up and marry local girls, but tragedy strikes again. All three men, father and grown sons, die, leaving Naomi and her daughters-in-law widows. Naomi sets her mind on returning to her home in Bethlehem and releases her daughters-in-law from caring for her any longer. But Ruth refuses to leave her mother-in-law and pledges to her in words that are well known and often recited at weddings, where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there will I be buried. May the Lord do thus and so to me, and even more as well, if even death parts me from you. So Naomi and Ruth return to Bethlehem together, and through hard work and some clever strategy, are incorporated back into the community and the family tree when Ruth marries Boaz, ensuring both her and Naomi's welfare. And as we shall learn, ensuring the very path of salvation history. This story that begins with famine and death ends with the joy of new birth and a concluding genealogy that connects Ruth to Israel's greatest king. She, a Moabite, is his great grandmother. A simple story with a happy ending and a story that packs a punch. You see, this is a radical story, a story with a purpose, a counter narrative to the prevailing mindset and puritanical theology of its day. Scholars believe the story of Ruth, though set in the time of judges before there were kings in Israel, was actually written much later after the eventual fall of the monarchy, generations down the line after the sacking of Jerusalem, after deportation to Babylon and 50 years of exile, written during the precarious and painstaking era of reconstruction, the rebuilding of their homeland and their faith. The books in the Bible that tell that part of the story are the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. Ezra and Nehemiah were priests and scribes concerned with the right practice of religion as well as the right angles in the rebuilding of the temple. Ezra and Nehemiah led the people in the renewal of both their religion and their public. And like so many people who have been through trauma and loss, the questions eventually rose about why they had suffered so greatly and what they could do to prevent such, such suffering in the future. The answer in that day is one we're tempted to land on in ours. We must have displeased God. We went astray. Our defeat and exile are our own fault. And like many people who are afraid of a return of trouble, Ezra and Nehemiah point fingers and find scapegoats. The reason God was so displeased with us was that we didn't keep our nation and our bloodlines pure, untainted by foreign influences. 
We watered down our piety and our purity through intermarriage with foreigners. If we want to please God now, we need to avoid such apostasy in the future. And Ezra and Nehemiah literally order all the foreign-born wives of Hebrew men to leave the country and their children too. Intermarriage is prohibited and enforced by deportation. At the same time that the books of Ezra and Nehemiah are being written and circulated, promoting faithfulness and national security through the banning of foreign wives, specifically calling out Moabites in their list of unwelcome women, the short, simple story of Ruth, King David's great-grandmother, emerges as well, telling a different story. That is one of the things that is so wonderful about the Bible. There are multiple perspectives represented, counter narratives included, various versions of the same events told from diverse points of view. We have two creation stories, four gospels, epistles from both Paul and James, who if I think if they were ever to meet, probably couldn't stay in the same room and remain civil. And we have Ezra, Nehemiah, and the book of Ruth. The book of Ruth, like so many other stories in the Bible, reminds us that God rarely colors within our lines. God brings outsiders in and kicks insiders out. God uses unlikely heroes and heroines to determine the course of salvation history. None of our bloodlines are pure and all of our origin stories are complicated. Like Ezra and Nehemiah, we look for simplistic answers to our problems or choose troubling talismans to ensure our future. Kick out the foreigners, deport the troublemakers, secure the borders, build a wall. The thing is, the Bible is full of stories of God and God's people crossing borders, finding refuge in foreign places, and tearing down walls. The crowning image of the whole darn book is a vision of the new Jerusalem whose gates are propped eternally open. Now, we may disagree about immigration policy in our time and place or political solutions to our broken immigration system, but the Bible is pretty darn clear about our relationship to strangers. They are among what the preacher Timothy Keller calls God's favorite four, widows, orphans, sojourners or strangers, and the poor. Over and over again in the Old Testament and New, we are reminded by God's prophets and God's son, our teacher, Jesus, that we will be held to account for how we treated the most vulnerable amongst us, the widows, the orphans, the sojourners, and the poor. Turns out, Ruth was all four. Maybe not a literal orphan, but besides losing her husband, her income, and her homeland, she left her natural family behind. And yet, Ruth, taken under the wings of refuge by both God and Boaz, not only finds a new home in Bethlehem, she becomes a listed matriarch in the family tree of not only Israel's greatest king, but Bethlehem's best known birth child, Mary and Joseph's baby Jesus, who himself will become a refugee, cross borders, and tear down walls of prejudice, shame, and self-righteousness. And his ministry? is now ours. How will we relate to strangers? How will we practice hospitality and welcome? How will we be brave like Ruth, generous like Boaz, and fiercely inclusive like Jesus? By faith, Ruth is our great-grandmother too. She is one of the cloud of witnesses who cheers us on as we run our race. She is probably 
the least likely character to have a book named after her in the Bible, a penniless widow, an immigrant woman from an enemy land. And there she is in the middle of our scripture. Her story poking holes in the dominant narrative of religious righteousness and nationalism. She reminds us that God is bigger than our borders and stronger than our walls. God, under whose wings we all find refuge, is the one whose story includes us all. Amen. And now we continue with song as Jim again leads us in the singing of beloved hymnody. In Christ there is no holy star west, in him no south or north, but one community of love throughout the whole wide earth. In Christ shall true hearts everywhere that I communion find. His service is the golden cord close binding humankind. Join hands, disciples of the faith, whate'er your race may be, all children of the living God are surely kin to me. In Christ now meet both east and west, in him meet south and north. All Christly souls are one in him throughout the whole wide earth. And now, my friends, May you continue your immigrant journey, for truly we are all living on borrowed ground. And may the one who walks so closely with you, you might not even know their presence, hold you, carry you when you need it, guide you when you're lost, and show you the vast horizon that is lit with the light of love. Amen. Of all the earth will kneel before him. 
on its foundation never to be moved These are the Foundation never to be moved 